Good morning and welcome to all of you who are joining us here in person and those of you who are joining in over Facebook and over Zoom or those who are watching later on in this week know that you are in our thoughts and prayers. Just a few announcements to bring to your attention for those of you uh, specifically who are here in the building. Immediately following the service, the pictures are going to be taken once again. If you have not uh, taken a picture for our church directory and you need to update your picture, uh, today and next week they will be taken downstairs in the library. I encourage you to, to do that so that we can update the directory and have them ready for everyone. The second announcement relates to Mark Anderson's uh, the celebration and thanksgiving for his, his uh, years of service with us. Uh, sept, uh, May 7th is the, is the service and the meal. Mark Anderson will be preaching and his family will be helping to serve in the service. Uh, we are collecting a love offering and thanks for all that he has done. This needs to be a cash gift to the church. If you want to make that, put that into an envelope or drop it off at the church, it just has to be clearly indicated that it's for, for Mark. We cannot receipt this gift. This is a personal gift, and so it's not uh, uh, tax receivable. As well, there will be a thank you card in the foyer when Eleanor Russell will be uh, um, in capturing everyone as they <laughs> attempt to, to leave. She will lasso people and drag them and drag you to force to sign the, the cards. Thank you, Eleanor, and thank you to everyone for willingly signing the, the card. With that, let us still our hearts and minds in the presence of Jesus, who is raised for the dead for our salvation, and who is with us by the Holy Spirit. Please stand and join us in the singing of Come People of the Risen King. Hear what the psalmist writes. Protect me, O God, in you is my refuge. To Yahweh I say, you are my Lord. My happiness is in none. My birthright, my cup is Yahweh. You, you alone hold my lot secure. I bless Yahweh who is my counselor. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep Yahweh before me always. For within him at my right hand, nothing can shake me. So my heart rejoices, my soul delights, my body will rest secure. Let us pray. May each of us who is gathered here today encounter you, Jesus Christ, and worship you as our risen King. May we remember that we have joy in your resurrection, your rising from the grave, and in so doing, conquering death by death and being the firstborn to bring hope to all who believe. May we seek to be united to you 
be united with you and in you so that we may be transformed into new creations through the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Let us welcome one another. Let's continue in worship as we sing together, Worship Christ, the Risen King. volunteers who would like to volunteer one two come on up three all right come on over here I need you guys to come over here and do something we're gonna have play a little game kind of squatch down so nobody can see you can you put this on your head and you can put this on your head can you help with the, help with the mustache okay and then um, Okay, you are gonna come with me first, okay? So stand up and let's walk back to the front. Yeah, walk this way. Now, I have no idea who this guy is. Anybody know who this is? Can you guess? Who is it? Oh, I heard somebody out there say it. Might have been his mom. Do you know who this guy is? He's a lamb, yeah. <laughs> yep. Do you know his real name? Can you tell? 
He's in disguise. You have no idea? Oh. Well, his mom recognized him, said it was Max. Is that right? Are you, are you Max? Yeah. Okay, okay, you stand here for a second. All right, I need the next person. Put that over your face. The front part over your face. Okay, all right, come on over. Okay, so who, do we know who this person is? Now this person's in disguise too, though. Here, just move this way a little bit. Who, who might this be? Come on, you guys, do you know? Yeah, what, what's, what's her name? Christine. Oh, we didn't fool you. Okay, Christine, show your face. Let's see if it's really you. Okay, it is. Good job. Okay, one more. Come on over. All right, now this one's going to get you for sure. Anybody have any idea who, who this person is? <laughs> Wyatt Earp? <laughs> do, we know, do we know their name? Come on. <laughs> I think we probably, can, can you guess? Who is it? Lillian, that's right. Okay, so how come they're in disguise, but you can still tell who they are? How do you know that? What gives them away? Probably your shirt. Your shirt might have given you. Is that the one you made a few weeks ago? Yeah, no. Oh, it's a different one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's not All right. Maybe they're, so their clothing might have given them away. How about how tall they are? Would that maybe give them away? Like if Isaac was up here, he would be quite a bit smaller. Might be. Okay, you guys can go take those things off over oh, there. Yeah, yeah. So in today's story, Jesus is walking along the road with two people that he knew for a long time. And they're walking along the road, and they have no idea it's Jesus. So this is after the resurrection, and, and these two people are just walking along, and this person joins them and starts talking to them and says, hey, how come you guys look so sad? And they're like well, haven't you heard what's going on? Like, this has been a really big weekend. There's been all kinds of things happening. And they have no idea who this person is. So they start telling him about how Jesus died and was resurrected and how the women went to the tomb and they found it empty and now they were confused. They didn't know what was happening. They still didn't recognize who was with them. And then they went, um, they were going to, they went, got to the town where they were going to stay and they said, well, we're going to have supper here. And so Jesus pretended he was just going to keep on going. They're like, no, no, come join us. Oh, I forgot an important thing. As they're walking, Jesus was explaining how the scripture was telling all the things about why all of those things had to happen with Jesus, that Jesus did have to die, and that Jesus was going to be resurrected, and that they didn't have to worry. And they still didn't recognize him, even when he was doing the scripture. And then they got into the house, and Jesus did something. So he, he agreed to join them for supper. And when he got into the house, he did something that he's done before. He came in and he broke the bread and he blessed it. And guess what? They recognized him. They recognized him. Exactly. All of a sudden they figured out. Their eyes were opened and they understood that it really was Jesus. You're right. They were blind. Yep in a way. All right, so let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Jesus and that we can see throughout your word, your plan for us and for Jesus. We thank you that Jesus did appear and was resurrected and that we can recognize Jesus in our lives and what we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
Happy are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Please join me in a prayer of confession. Loving and merciful Heavenly Father, Good Shepherd, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the schemes and the desires of our own hearts. We have violated your holy laws. We've left things undone that we should have done. And we have done things that we should not have done. And there is no health in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us, needy offenders. Spare those who sincerely confess their faults. Restore those who humbly repent. Do not take your spirit from us, but fill us once again, so that for Jesus' sake we might hereafter live a godly, righteous, and disciplined life to the glory of your name. Amen. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Having confessed your sins, know that you are forgiven. Thanks be to God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I'd like to invite Marianne to come forward for a moment and to share from God at work in her life. Marianne is working with IVCF at the U of R. And you can just come straight up. <laughs> Marianne is, uh, was born in Musiman, and she was a U of R student in psychology. She graduated in 2021. She was uh, friends with Fran, who some of you will remember. She was a part of IVCF when, it was on camp when, uh, when she was a student on campus. When, since she graduated, she's been working in a group home but she decided last, over the last year and a half that she was being called to come back to U of R. And so she's, but she loved what she was doing in the group home, and so she'd been splitting half-time U of R IVCF and half-time group home. Marianne, maybe you could tell us, what made you decide to come back? Sure. <clears throat> um, hello, good morning. Um, yeah. For me, I decided to um, apply because um, to join staff because I felt like God was laying evangelism on my heart. Um, there was a few things um, that happened early in 2022. Um, it just felt like the theme of, of sharing my faith kept coming up. Um, I went to a scripture camp in Saskatoon uh, where the Saskatoon InterVarsity was doing a weekend of diving in um, to some of the Gospels. And when I was there, there were students who were um, really close to coming to faith, non-Christian. And it was really exciting um, to be in the midst of that. Um, and then actually when I came back from that, I was praying like, God, like, sharing my faith it can feel sometimes awkward or or forced but just give me the opportunity to share um and um a few weeks later there was a girl that i was working with at the group home and um i was getting to know and she asked me she's like why marianne why are you a christian and so i w was like okay god i prayed for this <laughs> and um so i just shared with her some of my story and yeah instances like that were just kept coming up and it felt like god was putting it on my heart and um i applied and joined staff with intervarsity last august yeah. okay <laughs> The last few years have been difficult for the, the current group of students with COVID starting. Many of them started uh, mm -hmm. online and didn't, weren't meeting in person at all. Mm -hmm. uh, IVCF ministries struggled. They, how do we get together? How do we gather? How do we meet for studies and for fellowship? Uh, so you coming back is, is an answer to our prayers, and it couldn't have come at a better time to rebuild the ministries on campus. Mm -hmm. You've got a couple Bible studies that you've 
been making sure are continuing to run on campus. You've tried to make yourself visible. You shared how <laughs> you set up uh, the, the, what do they call them, greeting tables? Not greeting tables, but. Yeah, like a table. Tabling, yeah, you call yeah, it tabling. <laughs> That's the word, you made it a verb. Yeah. I was tabling. Um, and there were social events, including um, uh, trying to reach out to people and to build relationships. Mm -hmm. well, is there one story that you could share with us about uh, this past year? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, it was a bit challenging this year because, um, yeah, our group really dwindled down. When I was first joined InterVarsity, there was like 40 people coming and it really felt like a community. But then the pandemic, um, with the pandemic, students who were involved had graduated and, yeah, new students, we couldn't, we couldn't meet them because everything was online. Um, and so a prayer of mine this year was that I could meet students who were passionate about um, Jesus and communicating their faith to, to other students. Um, and because if, it, if the group was just me, like that's not very <laughs> exciting for people to come join when there's, there's one person. I really, my hope was that InterVarsity would start to feel like a community again. And I was reflecting back earlier in April, and I was like, wow, God really answered that prayer. I've met several students who, um, who, who are passionate about Jesus and do want to share their faith. And one example is I met a student in February, and we were, yeah, tabling, which just means we, we set up a table in kind of the main area where there's a lot of traffic of students walking by, and a student came up to me, and he was, he was like, um, he's like, oh, Christians, I've met my people, um, because he, he's new to Canada, and um, he's, he's a believer, and he for about two months he's like I haven't really met that many Christians on campus and so he was he was hoping to meet um, community and um, to, to meet other Christians and um, so he's he's come a few times to events that we've held on campus he's uh, also very eager to to talk about like how can we share with with our classmates um, so I'm I met other students like him and I'm excited um, to keep getting to know them and that hopefully it'll feel like a community which I think will attract more people when it's when it's not just one or a few people but more like a group um, so yeah I'm really I'm really thankful for the ways that God has answered prayer this year yeah so you have next weekend you have the uh, Bible study camp and um, and you'll be meeting with students who are remaining in, the, in, in Regina over the summer ahead of next, uh, next fall. And you've got, on one hand, you were able to start because you had 100% of your support, but um, going forward, you have 60% of your support raised and sort of committed in commitments. So we, we will pray for those things. And could we take a moment and just pray for you right now, Marianne? Sure. Okay. Yeah, thank Would you. you please <laughs> join me in praying for, for Marianne, for the... Uh, IVCF ministry. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. We have been praying for years that you would raise up leaders at the U of R. And so we thank you that this Mary Ann has responded to your call, that she has taken this step courageously. We thank you for the way you have placed uh, these, some very specific visions in her heart, a vision to share the good news about Jesus Christ with, with others, especially students at the U of R. A vision to build up community, to build up relationships, and to build the program, and to build up leadership again. We pray that, just as you have answered our prayer and brought Mary Ann, that you would answer all of our prayers and Mary Ann's prayers in these areas, that you would give them more chances to share the gospel with the people who are struggling with so many different concerns of this world of those who are looking for Jesus that you would also build up the community that you would help them to to love each other and to get to know each other and to pour their time into building up the ministry we pray that you would bring other Christians out from the campus to uh, who would seek out IVCF with a vision to help build it up and we pray for Marianne's funding and her work over the summer we trust that you will continue to raise up the money that is needed 
that you would bless her efforts this summer. We ask that you would protect her from the enemy, fill her with your Holy Spirit, that you would keep her healthy, that you would guide her all the way through these years. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> morning. Our epistle lesson today is taken from the book of First Peter and chapter 1, and I'm going to be reading verses 17 through 23. And I'm going to be reading this out of the Good News translation, but uh, you can follow along. You call him Father when you pray to God, who judges all men alike, according to what each one has done. You must, therefore, spend the rest of your lives here on earth in reverence for him. For you know what was paid to set you free from the worthless manner of life received from your ancestors. It was not something that loses its value, such as silver or gold. You were set free by the costly sacrifice of Christ who was like a lamb without defect or spot. He had been chosen by God before the creation of the world and was revealed in these last days for your sake. Through him you believe in God, 
who raised him from death and gave him glory. And so your faith and hope are fixed on God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth and have a sincere love for your fellow believers, love one another earnestly with all your hearts. For through the living and eternal word of God, you have been born again as the children of a parent who is immortal, not mortal. Our responsorial lesson is taken from Psalm 116. Please join me in reading responsively. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol lay hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up a cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Stand for the gospel lesson as you're able. Our gospel lesson today is taken from the Gospel of Luke and chapter 24 and uh, verse 13 through verse 35. And this is the walk to Emmaus. On that same day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking to each other about all the things that had happened. As they talked and discussed, Jesus himself drew near and walked along with them. They saw him, but somehow they did not recognize him. Jesus said to them, what are you talking about back and forth as you walk along? And they were stood still with sad faces. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only man living in Jerusalem who does not know what has been happening these last, there these last few days? What things, he asked. The things that happened to Jesus of Nazareth, they answered. This man was a prophet and was considered by God and by all the people to be mighty in words and deeds. Our chief priests and rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they nailed him to the cross. And we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. Besides all that, this is now the third day 
since it happened. Some of the women of our group surprised us. They went at dawn to the grave, but could not find his body. They came back saying they had seen a vision of angels who told them that he is alive. Some of our group went to the grave and found it exactly as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, how foolish you are, how slow you are to believe everything that the prophets said. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things and enter his glory? And Jesus explained, exclaimed to them what was said about him in all the scriptures, beginning with the books of Moses and the writings of all the prophets. They came near the village to which they were going, and Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they held him back, saying, stay with us. The day is almost over and it is getting dark. So he went, he went in to stay with them. He sat at table with them, took the bread, and said the blessing. Then he broke the bread and gave it to them. Their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. They said to each other, wasn't it like a fire burning in us when he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up at once and went back to Jerusalem where they found the 11 disciples gathered together with the others and saying, the Lord is risen indeed. Simon has seen him. The two then explained to them what had happened on the road and how they had recognized the Lord when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. We have, throughout Lent, talked about how life is a road, and how that is a metaphor for life, the journey or the road. And the end of the journey is the words that we heard today. Christ is indeed raised from the dead. Our journey is a journey through death to resurrection and new life. Throughout Lent, the journey that we reflected on was the journey of the prodigal son returning home. We long to arrive home, the fullness of life that is found in the presence of God, captured in the Father's words to his Son, I am always with you, and all that I have is yours. In today's lesson, there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus, on their own journey. And there are three things I'd like us to reflect on from this story. That Jesus is with us, whether we recognize him or not. Jesus is with us as we journey through life. That Jesus awakens our hearts. And that recognizing Jesus likely comes with some struggle and with some conflict. Jesus is with us whether we recognize him or not. This story from Luke is primarily told so that we might know that there were witnesses to Jesus' resurrection from the dead, to Jesus physically rising from the dead, being seen and touched and heard, so that we would know that Jesus is alive. 
But at first, these disciples do not recognize Jesus. How could they? Jesus was dead. But these stories in the Gospels and the way they are told serve to increase the credibility of the witnesses. The story is unbelievable. No one, though, was expecting it. Their witnesses all experience doubt, shock, and fear. And only slowly are, does all of this give way to joy. It increases the credibility of this testimony, that they weren't expecting it, that somehow the story of Jesus wasn't invented to serve purposes that everybody was expecting or that these disciples had been taught to expect. No one was expecting it, and they are honest about that. But the disciples on the road failed to recognize Jesus on more levels than just a physical level. As they are walking along and talking to Jesus, it is clear they didn't recognize Jesus in the scriptures either. Jesus repeatedly defied everybody's expectations. He repeatedly, he repeatedly surprised people when he met them. Having lived and listened to Jesus, they had failed to recognize who he was as well, what his purpose was, what his goals were. Consistently, the disciples and those around Jesus did not recognize him, did not understand who he was and what he was doing. In the beginning of the book of Acts, the disciples clearly still do not understand. After everything that has happened, the first words they say to him before the ascension are, now are you going to restore the kingdom? They are still thinking in a very different way than Jesus. They're still struggling to recognize Jesus and to know him. It is no surprise that they struggled to know Jesus before he died, that they struggled to recognize him after his resurrection. This story resonates with many of us in modern, the modern West. We sense as we journey through life that there is more to life than what we just see around us, than the goals that we're presented with. We sense that we are not alone, whether we are believers or not. The Christian philosopher Charles Taylor puts it this way, it is as if the world and our lives are haunted with the presence of God. The people around us cannot believe, and we struggle to believe, but at the same time we sense we sometimes have an eerie feeling or an ache or a longing for we don't know what, we don't know for whom. Modern Western, Westerners also have such high hopes for the world, for their nation, and yet such horrific disappointments repeatedly. There are such high hopes that we'll be able to bring about a world of peace and of justice. There is a longing for sexual freedom, for self-discovery. There is such faith in technology, in medical breakthroughs. In short, there are such hopes that now we will bring about the redemption of the world. And when the disciples say these words, we get it. When they say, we thought Jesus would be the one to bring about the redemption of Israel, we get it. We get the hope that they had for a better world and that sense that maybe this would be the time that it would come. And so we get their crushing disappointment when Jesus was crucified and buried. We get their despair. Every generation now, going back hundreds of years has, in the West, has had this hope that we are on the cusp of creating a perfect order, a perfect system, a perfect ideology, and we'll be able to bring peace. And every generation faces these hopes dashed with death, and violence. We may have had such hopes even for our own lives and for those we love. And so we face this disappointment on a very personal level. And how else can one live but with hope and plans and expectations for life? And it's only natural that we might connect our hopes and plans with God's blessings and God's love for us. If God loves us and God cares for us, then clearly God must want the best for us. So clearly, when things are going well, this is a sign that there is a God who cares and is near me and loves me. So when things don't work out, 
as they hadn't worked out for the disciples on the road to Emmaus. When things turn to pain, when things, when we are faced and burdened with grief or illness, when life is a struggle, we say, I had hoped that God would save me. It wasn't supposed to be like this. But throughout all of this, Jesus is there. Jesus is alive. They couldn't see him, but he was walking right beside them. They could have reached out and held his hand as they walked and listened. He was caring for them, gently waiting for the right way to open their eyes and to help them understand. He was watching over them, even in the midst of their confusion and in their pain. Jesus is walking with you as well. Every day, whether you recognize Jesus or not, he is there at your side, walking with you, listening to you, caring for you. Jesus is walking with you. And it is Jesus who awakens our hearts. Jesus said, did you not understand that from the scriptures that all of this had to happen to me? And then he began to explain, using the law and the prophets and the Psalms, how all of this was meant to be and had to happen in order to bring about the new creation. The disciples concluded at the end, didn't our hearts, or as it was from the Good News version, wasn't it like a fire in our hearts when he was speaking to us? Jesus must be the one himself to reveal himself to us. Jesus must take the initiative. I know that the, for those of you who have been in the Learning for Life class in Luke, and it's consistent throughout all the Gospels, that you've reflected on how Jesus is consistently the one who has to show people his hands and show people his feet as if somehow these were hidden or not just there in plain sight. Jesus shows them. Jesus is the one who takes the initiative who provides the invitation. He shows them his hands, his feet, his side. He sits and eats. He lets them touch him. The disciples on the road could not see Jesus. Jesus had to reveal himself to them. The disciples on the road didn't understand what the Bible said about Jesus. Jesus had to reveal it to them. Revelation is up to Jesus. There is nothing that we can do. There is no practice. There is no study. There is no amount of goodness or faith that we can muster up for Jesus to be revealed to us. It is a gift of grace. And therefore, if you know Jesus at all, it is a sign that Jesus knows you, knows you by name, cares for you, has chosen you, has spoken to you, and is walking with you. If you know Jesus at all, if your heart has ever burned as you listen to the scriptures, that is the work of Jesus reaching out to you and inviting you. Every step of recognizing Jesus a little bit more, of getting to know him a little bit more, is a sign that Jesus Christ is alive and is near you that moment. The disciples' hearts burned within them. They called to Jesus, don't go, stay with us. They started to sense his absence because he was with them, not because he was absent. They started to sense that he was distancing himself because he was right there and they knew him. He had helped them see. It is common for all Christians to go through periods where we feel as if Jesus is not there where we suddenly feel a distance, an emptiness, a silence, and we conclude God is absent from us. Something has distanced me from God. Something has happened and gone wrong. But counterintuitively, I would suggest that this stirring in our hearts of longing to be closer to God, this dissatisfaction with the distance we are sensing is not a sign of the absence of Jesus, but rather that Jesus has drawn near to you in that moment and you're suddenly, your heart is stirred to know him more. It is not a sign of his absence, but it is his activity, his care for you. He appears in those moments because we are seeking him in our hearts. 
But if Jesus is the one doing all of this, then why is it so hard often? If Jesus is the one who chooses to reveal and reveals himself, if Jesus is the one calling and inviting, why shouldn't it just happen? Why would there be any struggle at all if the one who can create and heal with just a word is the one speaking to us? And yet recognizing Jesus is often a struggle. Luke gives us a few lessons from the struggles the disciples faced as they tried to recognize Jesus. The first is, of course, just rational doubt. People do not rise from the dead, especially the way Jesus rose from the dead. But Kaylee spoke to this last week. I invite you to watch her sermon again if you want to think about how we face our own doubts, our rational doubts. There is also, though, a conflict between our plans and goals and purposes and the goals and purposes and the plans of God. The disciples said, we thought he would be the one to do this thing that they were expecting. In other words, they thought Jesus is going to restore a political kingdom. Jesus is going to restore the power and the prestige of Israel among all the nations. Jesus is going to accomplish this within history. They had their own ideas. And this caused a conflict with what God was actually bringing about through Jesus. You don't look like the Messiah we were told to look for. You're not what we were looking for or watching for. It's hard to recognize you. And we have a similar conflict in our lives. We expect God to do certain things for us, whether it's consciously or unconsciously, and that leads us to conflict with what Jesus is who Jesus actually is and what God is actually trying to bring about in our lives. Jesus walks with us and invites us to know him, but it is hard for us to submit to his plans and to his agenda. But there are darker reasons that we find ourselves struggling to recognize Jesus. To recognize Jesus and to know him more is to submit to his will morally. And there are things that sometimes we want to hold on to things that we don't want to let go of, but that we must if we are to stay in relationship with Jesus. And there's a third, a fourth thing, shame. I heard the story of a pastor who in their own church found out about things that were happening that should not be happening and spoke to the leadership. And the leadership would not listen. And so spoke to the entire congregation. There was resistance, and the attack was intense. Friends abandoned her and attacked her. But once all was out in the open and was finally being addressed, people understood that she had done the right thing, the only way forward. There was slowly reconciliation. She said that she suddenly understood the resurrection stories in a new way. It was painful for my friends to spend time with me after that. It was awkward at first and tentative. They had rejected me. They had publicly attacked me. In a word, they felt shame and pain whenever I was with them. When I saw in the resurrection stories, I saw Jesus returning slowly into the lives of his dearest friends who could or must even have felt such terrible shame. And therefore, I saw Jesus doing so, reintroducing himself into their lives slowly, gently, and graciously, meeting them, but then giving them time alone, meeting them again, trying to rebuild their trust. To disciples, this happened. Does shame prevent any of us from approaching Jesus? Does shame prevent any of us from walking beside him? Does shame prevent any of us from coming forward to the table and eating his meal? We can trust Jesus with our most painful failures. Pride also can lead us to reject asking for Jesus' help. Our logic, our reason, wants us to say no, that this isn't possible, that re resurrection cannot have happened. And it's hard for us 
to ask Jesus for help. Pride can lead us to reject submitting to the common means that Jesus uses for all of us to know him more. Prayer is not for me. That's not the kind of person I am. Communion isn't when I meet Jesus. It's not a big deal if I miss it. The Bible is really for others. It's old, it's confusing, it never really speaks to me. But these are the ways that Jesus uses, the common means for all of us to get to know him and draw nearer to him. And in fact, the disciples modeled for us in this story how to accept Jesus' invitation and to recognize him in our lives. They opened up to him as they walked along. They opened up their hands and they spoke honestly and directly to Jesus about their disappointment, about their doubts, about their confusion, about all the ways they disagreed with God. In a sense, they were saying with open hands, here is why we can't see you right now, Jesus. They also looked and listened to Jesus as they read the Bible. This was more than study, more than just trying to understand it. It was understanding that as they read, they were reading about Jesus who was near them and alive, that the Bible was speaking about him and that he was speaking to them through the Bible. And finally, they ate his meal, the Lord's Supper, communion, the Eucharist. They understood when they ate that meal, suddenly their eyes were opened and they saw Jesus. They understood that there was a close connection between this meal, the breaking of the bread, the drinking of the wine, and seeing Jesus. Who are you looking for? Is Jesus walking beside you? And what are you willing to do to recognize Jesus, to learn to know Jesus more? We may not recognize him. We may not understand all the time. But Jesus is alive, and he is walking with us. The Father says, I am always with you. And all I have is yours. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, I am with you to the end of the age. And the Holy Spirit says, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come and live within you. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Please join me in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this week with its ups and its downs, with its terrible weather and its beautiful sunny skies. And we just pray for us to recognize you in all of those things, the good and the bad. We pray for all of those who are currently looking for work. We pray that you would find them work that would be matching their needs and their abilities. We pray for relationships in our families, in our homes, with our friends. Help us to have wisdom, to show patience and forgiveness, just as you taught us to do. We pray especially for Vic and Irene Satropa and the whole Satropa family, as it was the one year anniversary of Christopher's death. And we just pray that you would give them strength to keep going, peace, to know that Christopher is with you, and strength just to keep going each day. We pray also for those who are recovering. We pray for Judy who is recovering from surgery, and also for those who are awaiting test results or treatment plans. We pray also for those who are in pain, whether that was caused by accident or injury or unknown causes. Please, Lord, just be their strength and their courage as they deal with that. We pray for those who are sick. We think especially of Flyness. Be with her in her illness and Manfred as he supports her. We pray for Barry, for the tests that he can undergo this week, and we just pray that his iron levels will come back up to the level where they need to be. And we also pray for his move at the end of June, as there's so much to do and it can be a stressful time. Lord, give him peace, give him the people around him that he needs and what he needs to move safely and well. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you give us for the sun that has finally come out, for the health to come here and meet together. We pray for so many people who are dealing with colds right now, and we just pray that their bodies would be strong enough to fight them off. We pray also for those whose memories are disappointing them. Give them strength and encourage them in the days when that can be very frustrating, and also for those around them who are taking care of them. We bring all of these things to you, and we ask them in your name, Jesus, and we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We thank you also, Lord, for all that you do for us and for this small amount that we give back to you in our time, in our money, and in our love for each other. Strengthen and encourage us to continue to give as much as we can. Amen. Please stand.
as you go, go with the blessing of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And may your hearts burn within you as you read the scriptures and listen to the words of Jesus. May your eyes be open to recognize that he walks with you. And may the Spirit of God guard your hearts with peace. Amen. Thank you.